Welcome everybody. Good morning. Let's start in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Eternal God, as we approach the season of Advent, Lord, we ask you to just stir the gift of your Spirit within us once more, to increase our faith in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to increase our hope in the promises you have made and that sustain us by your Spirit, and increase the charity for you are love itself. We ask you, Lord, that you just continue to bless us with an open mind, an open heart, and open he ears to hear your word, to feel your presence, and to carry out your will. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we're on chapter 4, the last chapter of... Uh, Philippians, and as I mentioned a few times, uh, and if you have a New American Bible translation, you'll see that right before chapter 4 starts, you have sort of an editorial comment where they refer to it as Roman numeral 6, the instructions for the community. And that's because Paul, um, although he's been confident and hopeful throughout this letter of uh, being you know, released and return and be able to see the Philippians, he knows very well that there's just as good a chance that he'll be uh, executed and never see them again, which is in fact what did happen. And so really from chapters three and four, but especially chapter four, it's kind of like Paul's last will and testament that he's kind of focusing on. Now, last week we started looking at it, the first uh, three verses, and we'll just sort of review those real quick and then move on. The fourth chapter is kind of, um, it's divided really into kind of just four parts. First, this issue that's going on between two members of the community that he has to deal with. Then the longest section, uh, or the second section, has to do with Paul's kind of last moral teaching, so to speak, for the, for the church in Philippi. He kind of throws a lot of things out there to just sort of give them last instructions regarding the moral and spiritual life of the Christians. Then starting with verse 10 to verse 20, the longest section, but actually you can go through it rather quickly, Paul's going to address the issue of um, the fact that they have, have sent him money and what, you know, what that means. And then just the last three verses, he does, a, for Paul, a very short and kind of crisp farewell, but there's something in there that's important for us to look at. So going back to the first four, uh, three verses, though, of chapter 4, he says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to come to a mutual understanding in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my true yokemate, to help them, for they have struggled at my side in promoting the gospel, along with Clement and my other co-workers whose names are in the Book of Life. So as we mentioned last week, Yodia and Syntyche are some kind of prominent um, people in leadership of some capacity in the church. Probably they're the two women in whose meetings, in whose homes the house churches meet. So you met in homes because the church Christianity was illegal. And they've probably sort of developed a rivalry with each other. It doesn't seem to be any, anything doctrinal because Paul doesn't mention anything and he would take a stand there. Paul doesn't seem to have an opinion one way or the other. That's why he both urges Euodia and urge Syntyche. He makes very clear that he refers to each the same way, that they just need to come to some kind of agreement. So it's probably something to do with status, issues like that. And it's clear that they should know better because he says they've struggled at my side in promoting the gospel along with Clement and my other co-workers. And the term co-workers he only uses for missionaries, Paul. So these women were missionaries, probably in Philippi itself, but they were in the trenches, preaching the gospel, evangelizing people. And so the two of them should know better. And that's why Paul calls it out publicly, because remember, this would be read at the Lord's Supper for them to hear. He also mentions this yoke mate, we're not sure who it is. It may, may be Epaphroditus who he's sending back with the letter. Uh, it's a male. We know that just from the gender of the nouns used and such by Paul. But as I mentioned last week, 
Paul is sort of going into Jesus' own teaching here that you go one-on-one -on -one with people and try to resolve the issues before you, and you take steps before you bring it to the, um, the entire church to have to decide sort of in an official capacity. So that's what we looked at last week. And the, last, the only thing I'll mention is the very last verse here of chapter 3, the last part. He mentions whose names are in the book of life. And like many things that Paul writes, uh, Paul has, uses sort of a double entendre here because he has two meanings when he says this. On the one hand, the cities of the ancient world, at least the Roman and Greek cities, kept registers with the citizens' names engraved upon them. So it keeps going back to that idea that Paul's been facing throughout this whole um, book and what's going on there, that it's reminding them where their real citizenship is, in heaven, not here on earth, and so not to get involved in all these petty arguments that they're getting kind of focused on. But that idea of the book of life also has a very, um, a very biblical background, going all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy, where it's used to describe the record of who is in the covenant. That's why in the Old Testament, you'll hear people about being cut off from the Lord. That means, in our terms, excommunicated. But they're cut off from the covenant people. They're no longer part of the book of life. And you see an example of this if you turn to um, Revelation, where you can see how this is used in the Bible. In Revelation, chapter 20, verse 11, we see where this, we see one instance of this. It's found everywhere. Jesus mentions it, Paul does, John does here, the Old Testament. So it's everywhere throughout the Bible. But here's a pretty clear understanding of what it is. So Jesus has come, evil has been vanquished, and now he's, um, the last judgment is going to occur, and then with 21 will be the resurrection and the eternal life and the kingdom. But he, So the last thing he says, Next I saw a large white throne and the one who was sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, the great and the lowly, standing before the throne, and scrolls were opened. Then another scroll was opened, the book of life. The dead were judged according to their deeds by what was written in the scrolls. The sea gave up its dead, then death and Hades gave up their dead. All the dead were judged according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the pool of fire. This pool of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the pool of fire. So in this judgment scene, the individual scrolls um, represent our own lives and our deeds. And so those are read out and they're compared then to the book of life, which is God's record, um, for those who will basically inherit eternal life. And the church has kept this on forever. You may be aware, some of you might have gone through RCIA or have people who did that you know. And at the beginning of Lent, there's the right of election and the right of sending. And so in church... Any of the catechumens, those who are not already baptized, part of the ritual is they sign a book that's representative of the book of life. And then that book is taken into the rite of election and presented to the bishop who then signs his name on it that he accepts that, that they are now the elect. They're on their way to the Easter sacraments. So even liturgically, this idea of the book of life is still something that the church continues to use as symbolic of salvation, of things like that. So... Um, Paul kind of moves on from this now, and I've sort of outlined it or given you a little chart so we can follow Paul's train of thought. But what he's going to do now, and it's, it's quite common in Greco-Roman writings, is Paul is just going to give us a smorgasbord. He's just going to throw a lot of things out there um, to kind of you know, give, give a lot of exhortations right at the end. Uh, he's done this in Thessalonians and some of his other lot, uh, letters, and he's going to. But there is sort of a, 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 a method to the madness, it seems, where he's just throwing out different verses and, and phrases here. And so I'm kind of. I'll read it, and then we'll break it down. So starting with verse four, he says, "Rejoice in the Lord always." I shall say it again, rejoice. Your kindness should be known to all. The Lord is near. Have no anxiety at all, but in everything. By prayer and petition, 
with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Then the God of peace will be with you. So he kind of has two little subsections here. Um, verses 4 through 7 are one, and then he has like this sort of addendum one, verses 8 and 9. But in both cases, he ends with the idea of peace. Verse 7, then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So that ends this first section. Then the second one, the last, very literally the last sentence of verse 9, then the God of peace will be with you. So it's all geared towards um, drawing the, our Christian life, our Christian experience to this peace, this peace that, as Jesus says, only he can give, that the world cannot give. What Paul is doing here. Um, it's important to recognize, if you notice in that second half of verse 7, he's talking about guarding your hearts and minds. Then in verse 8, the very last part, he says, think about these things. Everything that Paul is referring to here has to do with our way of thinking, our way of understanding. Paul here is specifically talking about what we would later call conscience. He's exhorting them to make sure that they have formed their conscience as well. And that makes sense. He may very well be dead soon. There's not going to be an apostle to lead them around by the hand or answer their questions. They need to know and be secure enough in their faith to be able to make those decisions to see what God's will is as these events occur. So he's really trying to bring them up to become mature Christians who don't need hand-holding, but because their faith and their, um, their formed consciences, they know what to do. So how does Paul sort of look at this? Well, the first thing, notice he starts with joy. And we have to be very um, clear here, because in English it can get dicey. In English, the terms joy and happiness, just like sorrow and sadness, are kind of used interchangeably in our language. But they're very different meanings throughout the biblical languages. And part of it is to recall that the human person is made up of three dimensions, not parts. We're really not parts, but three dimensions to our being. The outer one is that's what the body is. And the body experiences pleasure and pain. And that's about it. Then you have the soul, which a better, a better term for nowadays might be the idea of the mind, because that's what they meant. And the mind has to do with experiencing um, happiness and sadness. And then the inner part of us is the spirit, where we're really made in the image and likeness of God, sort of our true self. And that's what experiences joy and sorrow. So the human person exists sort of in these dimensions or in these depths of experience are, are all part of who we are. So joy is not simply a sensation. It's not the sensation or feeling of pleasure or pain. It's also beyond even happiness and, and sadness. What the mind does is it now adds another layer to pleasure or pain. You can have just a simple pain or pleasure, and it can end there, or um, because of the, what it's associated with in your emotional and mental life, you might actually add to that. You might add to the physical experience by sort of adding a mental component to it. Um, and then finally, this one is, is a spiritual experience that really comes from the life of the spirit. The thing is, though, is because all of these are different depths of experience, you can experience them simultaneously. 
So St. Peter, when he's crucified, is in the, in the accounts of it, goes with great joy. But he certainly isn't happy, and he certainly isn't experiencing pleasure. In fact, he's very much experiencing pain, and yet he can still be in joy. And that's the thing that differentiates this from everything else. Joy is unchanging in the sense that it's not affected by circumstance. All the other ones are. Even our term for happiness, where that comes from is the old English word hap, which means lucky. We still have a hangover if you hear the word happenstance. It's just luck, right? Why are people happy? Because they got lucky. Something good happened to them that day, but it's nothing to do with any lasting thing. But joy is different. Joy isn't based on circumstances or externals. Joy is something you can always possess. And the Christian should possess joy because knowing the destiny they have in store, knowing the love of God for them is proven in the, every time they look at a cross uh, or a crucifix, in realizing who they are as children of God, all these things should put us in this place of joy. That doesn't mean people are always giddy. Again, remember, these are not all the same things. And depending on your personality, your joy is going to ex be expressed differently. An introvert will not look like an extrovert in their joy, but it'll still be joy. So don't use other people's example of what you think joy is. What's interesting, though, is Paul tells us joy, we need to sort of make the, the, the basis of it all because it kind of enlivens um, the whole Christian life, which will, of course, have times of suffering and pain and sorrow and all those things we mentioned. And so he actually recommends two different practices um, in this particular passage on how to sort of keep this joy alive, but also how to develop a deeper relationship with Christ. And the two things he mentions are kindness and prayer. So if you look, uh, I started this at the bottom of page two with the bullet points. The other thing about joy is if you, if you were to go back and just gently glance through, read through really quickly or just glance around, you'll notice the word joy or rejoice occurs a lot of times throughout this book. And it sort of gives us a, a poignancy knowing that Paul himself is writing this about being joyful and rejoicing, and he's rejoicing in prison as he's awaiting possible execution. And he's writing to Philippians who he knows have started to experience some real problems in their lives because of their Christian faith. And so it shows this idea that the circumstances aren't things that can take away joy. They can make us unhappy. They can give us pain. But joy is something that um, can't be taken from us. It's sort of a gift from the Lord. So these two parts, kindness, we need to realize what he's talking about here so we understand really what Christians are called to do. Because when we see the word kindness, we sort of think just being nice to people. And that's not what the term really means at all, except superficially. In Greek, the term kindness, epiikios, means specifically forbearance. To for, be forbearing. In that way, he's telling us to be like Jesus, to be like God. One of God's attributes throughout the Bible is God is long-suffering. What does that mean? That means he puts up with us for a long time. Right? He doesn't just zap us the second he, he gets annoyed and we're doing things. No, he puts up with it, he puts up with it, he puts up with it. And that's what he's talking about now. Specifically, what Paul is talking about is that you have to be moderate in your use of, quote, justice. That is, you shouldn't seek retribution often, if at all, even legally. Paul says, why? Right? Why would you do that? All you're going to do is add problems to what's going on. He's saying, give people the benefit of the doubt. Always assume the good, no matter what they did. In other words... You're approaching people, we'd say today, with a sense of mercy. So your justice will be tempered by mercy. Because one of the things that we get from the Beatitudes and what Jesus is telling us as he, as he breaks sort of the mold of, of the Torah law is we have to be very careful because we're fallen human beings. And so 
because of that, humans are unjust. And so we do make systems and groups to try to instill justice, to try to be fair to people. But it's still fallen human beings who create the systems and the structures. And so as Bonaventure said 800 years ago, justice practiced strictly always becomes unjust. Right? If you demand every accounting for every right, for everything else, for every problem, you're going to you're going to develop a world and relationships with people that's terrible. That's horrible. And it doesn't just go on the he now Paul is talking about the public arena. What's interesting about this whole passage is he's talking about us out in the world. This is how Christians need to be towards non-Christians, especially so that they can get a view of it. But the same thing goes for the same understanding goes within the Christian life. That's why Paul twice, when he talks about fathers, he says, don't nag your children. Because <laughs> he means the same thing on the, on the personal level. If you correct every little single thing and let nothing go, that's not justice. You're creating a neurotic kid. I mean, you really are. They have, there has to be some kind of mercy. Yes, things, there has to be standards and stuff, but come on. Or as we say, you know, colloquially, pick your battles. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul's saying. He's all, you can't be a person out there in the world who's always demanding my rights, my justice. Because he says, not just for yourself, but he's saying, think of the bigger picture. What do people see in the church and Christ when they look at you? In other words, you're who they think of when they think of Jesus. You're the Christian they know. Therefore, how is this going to impact? So he's saying, be merciful. You know, be merciful in this, in this public arena. He's not saying you would never, ever assert your rights or tell the truth or things like that. But he's saying, let things go. Right? Let things that can go, go. Because a lot of it's just going to be answered out of pride, not a real necessity to do it. If it's a real necessity because harm can come to people or something like that, well, yeah then you assert your rights. But if we're talking about you've just been offended or this or that, Paul says, eat it up. That's what you're supposed to do. And so in connection with that, he says, if you actually go down, skip the next bullet point and go to the next one, he says, have no anxiety at all, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Here, Paul kind of sees... Uh, Paul kind of put, puts it in simple terms. He says, when you're faced with a trial or a problem or some kind of suffering comes to you, Paul says, you have two choices. You can get anxious, anxiety, or you can take it to God in prayer. Those are your two choices. Try to handle it on my own and get more frustrated and, and worried and scared and everything else. Or I can pray about it. I can, I can lay it at God's feet and then I still try to work it out but I'm coming from a whole different place. And so obviously that's the one Paul is, is talking about. He's, and he's saying, you know, when he's talking about prayer here, he's talking about, specifically he mentions prayer and petition. He says, whether it's your personal devotional time, that's what he means by prayer. He's not talking about the public prayer, like at the mass or church we're doing. He says, and when you are, you know, asking for things, um, he says, do so with thanksgiving. So we have to be grateful. In other words, we have to approach God already in a, in a uh, manner of gratitude, that I'm, I'm happy, Lord, for the gift of the very fact that I'm alive. I thank you for the gift of having made me Catholic. I thank you for the gift, you know, all these different things, so that when we come to him, we're really laying everything out, and it just opens us up to be open to what excuse me, he wants to say to us. So, you know, for all of us, no matter what type of prayer we're doing, thanksgiving or gratitude should always be what accompanies every type of prayer. And Paul also keeps his sort of Jewish standards, though, here. He says, make your requests known to God. Their requests. <laughs> no one demands anything of God, and God owes no one anything, no matter what we've, quote, done for him in our minds. And so it's always requests. Not that God isn't merciful, not that God isn't loving and won't give us many of these things, but it's not our right to demand them. So they have to be made 
again, in that gratitude idea with our requests known to God. Um, one of the things, and, and it, you know, as one of the things we find as we mature in faith, and that's what Paul is looking for. He's assuming by petition here, he means what we call intercession now. So there's been a, cha a change in language. Because now the word petition for us means to ask something for me. Where intercession means to ask something for someone else. Paul means here asking for someone else. Because remember, this whole thing is about building your conscience, becoming a mature Christian. And so he has no problem with the fact that we're going to ask God things. That's why that last line, make your requests known to God. That's our petition, as we understand it. So there's nothing wrong with asking God for things. But Paul assumes that as we mature in faith, just naturally we're, it's, we're going to find that less and less are we asking specific things for us. And instead we find ourselves asking specific things for others. That we want their success their health, their this and that. Um, so that it becomes, we become more communal again because Paul is understanding that he's telling the church this, we cannot forget the whole point of all this is communion. And we need to recognize this. So whether you're out in public with other human beings who aren't Christian, you act kindly. When you're in prayer and when you're thinking of your petitions and stuff, always think of others when you're doing this. And he says, if you do these things, kindness and if you act and you pray, if you leave it all to God, if you act the way Christ and God himself acts, then you will experience Christ that much more powerfully. That's why he says, the Lord is near. Paul means that kind of existentially. <laughs> that is, because we're baptized, the Spirit has placed the Son in us. Jesus is in us. He dwells in us. John, Jesus tells us that himself in John. Then on top of that, we have the Spirit accompanying us. Then as Catholics, we have the Eucharist where Jesus is present. And so Paul is saying, realize that everything you're doing, all of this, it's not you doing it by yourself, by your own power, but recognize that the Lord is with you all the time in this. He's your ally. You're aligned with him as he's leading you through your life. He's the one you call upon. To help me, you know, have some of your kindness, Lord. Jesus, let me experience the joy you experienced. We're making our prayers to him through the Holy Spirit to the Father. So Jesus is always present. So keep that in mind that everything we're doing, Jesus is present with us as Christians. And so that he's always involved in everything that's going on in our lives with this felt presence. But he also means by that that we will actually feel God more closely the more we live this life of prayer that's sort of giving everything, surrendering to the Lord, and the more we really treat our neighbors in this way of kindness, of forbearance, of not seeking you know, vengeance or redress or things like that. So, and then once that happens, once you get to that place where Christ is really felt powerfully, then he ends with the last one. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So notice, it's the peace that ex it surpasses all understanding. What that means is, it will come to you and abide in you at times when, humanly speaking, you, even you have no idea why you're not losing it. You know, Something really terrible has happened, a real tragedy and issue, and yet, you maintain this kind of calm through it all. You don't know why. You didn't even specifically ask for it in prayer or anything. It just kind of takes over. That's what he's talking about. It's something that the world can't give to us. And in this, he gets it directly from Jesus himself. Here's what Jesus said. It's, it's a quote here that I gave you in the handout. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. So the reality is the best peace the world can give us is a temporary absence of conflict. But that's all. 
And often, strangely enough, the reason that there's peace through an absence of conflict is why? Because someone with enough firepower made sure of it. In other words, it's still based on violence usually, or at least the threat of violence that peace occurs on a human level often. And so Paul is saying from Jesus, we're looking for a different kind of peace. This is the kind of peace that just like the joy remains. It doesn't matter if outward circumstances are all over the place crazy. It doesn't mean that suddenly things are just going to calm themselves around you. It simply means you won't be disturbed in the midst of whatever's going on in life, good or bad. You'll keep your peace. You'll keep that feeling of security, stability, gentleness. All that will um, overshadow you because the power of Christ is, in a sense, because of your actions, you're allowing Christ and the Spirit to act through you and with you so much more powerfully that the gifts of them start to just overflow into who you are. So that's kind of Paul's basic sort of message here. We're seeking this peace, and remember he's talking to people who are undergoing a lot of, not persecution in the sense of um, governmental, but a lot of alienation and problems. He's referring to himself, who's at peace, though he may very well be dead any day, and in fact he'll be dead less than a year after this letter is written, less than a few months, as far as we can tell. Um, so that God allows him to just maintain that peace. And in that peace is the certainty, you know, the certainty of God's power, of God's sovereignty, so that even death becomes something not to be feared because God's overcome death in Christ as he showed us. So that's what Paul is kind of leaving them. And then he turns right around with verse um, 9 or 8, and he gives us this little closing sort of, smorgasbord of little virtues. And I, I, I uh, have it printed for you also on page four at the very top. In typical Jewish fashion, he gives us seven. But he makes it clear that this, is, uh, this list is, illust is illustrative. It just is, these are just examples. Because he ends the last one so open-ended, it's clear that this is an ongoing list. So he again turns, and we can cover these pretty quickly, each one probably in about a line or two, as I mentioned here. He says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now, the thing to be aware of, all of these are what we would call public virtues, that is, Paul is mentioning things that, to telling the Philippians, here is how you as a Christian have to live in the world, in the marketplace. He is not talking about your personal devotional life, which of course is another aspect, but that's not what he's focused on. He's focused on these are some of the things. So it's, in other words, he's telling us by these terms how we need to interact with others. And so... A lot of times, the problem in English is, is we don't have a lot of multiple terms for things. For example, the term truth here is not the same one used by Jesus to say, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. So Paul is not here talking about intellectual correctness. He's talking about fidelity, truth in the sense of, I can depend on someone, they're trustworthy. It's not something that's just fantasy or mere appearance. In other words, I'm a person of integrity. The people can trust me when they tell me things because I'll, I'll be that kind of person. So as you notice here, that which is true refers to being dependable and trustworthy as opposed to mere appearance and fantasy. So it would include intellectual truth. You'd be an honest person as far as what you know the truth to be. But it goes beyond that. It just means people know they can count on you and not just Christian people. In other words, people in the world know that you're this kind of person. Secondly, honorable, to be a person of honor, means worthy of respect, awe-inspiring, dignified, in the pursuit of performance of moral excellence. So in other words, in basic terms, people know you're a good person. They don't look at you and think you're trying to act better than thou or, or any of that kind of stuff. They realize this is a person of integrity, I might not be a believer, but this is a person I can go to and, and ask them a question and get an honest answer. I can 
you know, reveal things to them and I know it's not going to happen. This is a person who has honor. They're worthy of respect. So you're showing your Christian life by being a person of trustworthiness that people can respect. And similarly, justice. To be just means to treat people fairly, you know, as, as Paul's been talking about. You need to be just in your um, relationships. Pure is justice, but simply refers to more on the sexual level. You don't, even back then, of course, you don't involve yourself in sexual scandals and everything else in the public eye. You don't, you know, you don't break the marriage bonds. You don't do these things. You may remain this person of integrity, of purity, of justice, to be honorable, someone that people respect. Uh, a good example of the Old Testament is like Saint, the old patriarch, Saint Joseph, not Jesus father, but St. Joseph of the Old Testament. A person of integrity, his master's wife tries to have an affair with him, he refuses, he's punished because of it, because she lies about it, and yet he never, he always maintains this kind of integrity, and in the end it rewards him. He's found to be this trustworthy, pure, just person, and he's made the vizier of all of Egypt. So that's kind of what Paul is pointing towards, you have to be this kind of person. Now, the next two are kind of interesting because they're not ones we would generally think of in a moral sense. Lovely or loveliness and graciousness or gracious, being gracious. Lovely is in the sense of being attractive and pleasing to others in one's manner of living and, in, and agreeableness. Gracious, euphema in Greek, is being praiseworthy, well-sounding. You have a reputation of goodness. What Paul is talking about here is he doesn't mean, you know, spend a lot of time on your clothes and money. What he's talking about is, do you make the, are you not only considered to be a good person of justice and such, do you make Christianity attractive to others? In other words, it's not just enough, Paul says, to, they look at you and they go, oh, he's a real good person, it must be part of his Christian faith. Do you present Christianity? Do you live your life in a manner that's beyond just saying Christians are just and these kind of people? There's something that attracts you. There's something that's, you want to be like that. You know, you look at what they're doing, you say, I want more of what you have. And it doesn't mean, and he doesn't mean you have to be flash or anything. It's just how you do it in your own way to make it attractive. Some of us are extroverts. They do it in a real exciting way and they invite people and others are introverts and they're more quiet how they approach it. But it's, when people see you, after a time, do they start to think to themselves, wow, you know, maybe i got to give Catholicism an another look, or maybe it's not what I thought it was. And it can be in very simple, ordinary circumstances. Um, for example, uh, Sister uh, St. Edith Stein, she's really Sister Teresa Benedicta, but Edith Stein, the Jewish convert. Um, doctorate of philosophy in Germany in the 30s and 40s at a time when no women had that kind of education. I mean, she had reached the pinnacle of what women could do. So a brilliant woman. And she was close, close friends with a, another professor and his wife. There weren't very many female professors at that time. And I mean, enough that they would, they, she went with them on their trips. They were wealthy, so they went, you know, they'd get up, go on vacations with her and stuff. Very, very good friends, the three of them. Now, she is an agnostic with shades of atheistic Jew. She does not practice her faith. She doesn't think of the God of Abraham and the whole idea of God. She's a little bit. Well, the husband dies. And so she and the wife continue their friendship. And um, it's about, I think she says it's like about a month or two afterwards. And they're sitting there and the wife's talking pleasantly and she's showing pictures and they're talking about, the, you know, all these things. And um, Edith can't take it anymore. <laughs> she goes, and she just bluntly asked her, how can you be so happy? Charles is dead, like your husband. Don't you get that? And the woman says, yeah, I know that. And then, But then she starts to actually explain her faith as a Catholic. And he just knew they were Catholics. They went to church. She just wouldn't go with them. She'd stay and do her thing when they were together. And, you know, her, her certainty of his existence, the certainty she would see him again. And she just said it with such conviction and plain. And she, and she 
the wife's not a philosopher. She didn't give Edith Stein some huge treatise on the existence of God. She just explained her life and she and her husband's and why she can be joyful even now. And Edith Stein would go on to become Catholic and a nun and then choose to die when she could have left in solidarity with the Jews that she was ethnically part of, but also as a Catholic nun. So, um, you know, to be attractive to others, it, it, it could happen a lot of ways. It doesn't mean you have to go out there and, you know, rah, rah, Jesus or something. That'll be some people's method and it works for them. You have to find what works for you. Maybe you're like the wife who just engages in conversation, but you say it with such conviction and assurance and such happiness and joy that it does something. You know, our, our, the current Holy Father, Pope Francis, is, puts a lot on that kind of idea. The encyclical on evangelization, if you remember, his first real encyclical is called The Joy of the Gospel. And he has a lot of those colorful quotes in there that Saint Francis is, or, uh, Pope Francis is known for because he's talking about some of these things, you know? Like he has the one quote, he says some, and, he, and it has to do with, also with this idea of attractiveness, but also joy. He kind of connects them. He says, that famous quote, he says, some Catholics' lives look like it's a perpetual Lent with no Easter, <laughs> right? In other words, that doesn't attract anybody. Who wants that? Somber, always, you know, this kind of thing. So we have to recognize, and Paul is telling his people who are starting to face these problems, he's saying, well, maybe you need to start acting differently. In other words, maybe you need to start acting more like Jesus himself. Jesus attracted people. He didn't force them. He didn't browbeat them. He didn't, as um, Benedict Grishel used to tell us, he didn't persecute them with prayer, right? <laughs> you get somebody trapped and say, so they can endure like a long rosary or something, and you know that they're not there for it you know anyway there's a lot of ways we can sort of make it unattractive the faith and so paul's saying no you gotta you've got to be attractive in all ways you have to be a person of integrity as a christian in public as well as private but in public he's talking about so that people people can't point to anything now let's be honest okay let's let's realize something and paul knows this better than anyone in his own life and that is this you will never please a lot of them, no matter what, right? If you act nice to them, they'll still despise you because they don't like Christianity and you're just being a hypocrite. But those are the same people who, when you do something bad, will call you on not living your Christian faith. So you can't win sometimes. And you just need to recognize that. That I can do all these things that Paul says. And like Paul, I can still find myself in jail or disliked, or whatever. And Paul just says, and that's just how it is. That's okay. Jesus didn't convert everybody, and he was the son of God. Don't think everybody's going to love you either. But that doesn't give you the excuse to now sort of use their methods, the methods of the world. Antagonism, argumentative, you know, cutting down comments, gossiping, whatever else it is. You still maintain who you are. Because somewhere, people do feel, you know, ashamed after a while. You treat, <laughs> when you know someone's really not wrong and you're treating them, you have to come at some point face to face with that ugliness in yourself of why am I so like this towards this person? And that's why Paul calls it heaping burning coals on their head. Right? <laughs> still love them no matter what they do. Still treat them respectfully with dignity. Don't get in arguments, you know. Um, and sometimes don't say anything, you know, keep your mouth shut. That's a good one too. Sometimes, right. It's becoming the holidays. Well, we already had Thanksgiving and <laughs> Christmas. I mean, it's true. We all have that, right? The holidays are great. And they're also stressful because there's family members you want to see and other ones you're like, God, I kind of hope they don't come this year. You know, <laughs> let's be honest. We all have those people and you're like, oh. but that's the thing is if you're already approaching it from this. And that's why he ends, he says, if there's anything excellent, notice he says, think on these things. In other words, before they become, before we're able to do these naturally, they're going to always feel a little stilted, like we're kind of putting on a show. But that's why Paul's saying, the more you make this part of your whole thinking process, the more you think about these things and reflect on them. And remember, this was the piece that guards hearts and minds. He's talking about all this stuff. 
is, you know, we, we have to have that well-developed conscience. And we have to have that trust in God. So this Christmas, what we do to ourselves is exactly the opposite. What, what do we do? We do bad thoughts. So that person is coming to Christmas Eve or whatever. <laughs> we know it. So what do we start doing? We start already thinking about how terrible it's going to be and what I'm going to have to endure. Where instead, you should be thinking about these things. Because what you do is you make yourself a self-fulfilling prophecy. By the time you get there, you're such a mess interiorly about this person. You'll probably be the one to start something because you'll say something, you know? And so Paul is saying, don't let that process start. You think on these things. You know, tell yourself. Tell yourself when you have certain thoughts. Say, that's not worthy me. You know, that's, that's an unworthy thought I'm having. Or that's a bad thought. And, and just call it what it is and let it pass away and start to really focus yourself on these kind of things, the, the conscience parts of who we are. And he mentions that, he says, then the God of peace will be with you. And the last thing he tells us here is, he says in verse um, 9, keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Now, Paul uses a Greek term here that he uses very rarely, and he always uses them for a big reason. Unfortunately, because we're not native Greek speakers, we miss it, we don't, we just read along there. But the word here that's translated learned and received, it's one word in Greek, and the word in Greek is paradosis. And it literally means to hand on and receive. The word in Latin that translates it directly is traditio, where we get the word tradition. So you think of it as a chain or handing on the baton. Someone hands it on to me, I receive it, and I'm going to hand on this same thing to others. And so Paul is again coming to that idea that he, as an apostle, they need to follow his teaching, what he's talking about. Because that's what he means. He says, keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. So he's um, talking about what we, that, you know, the truth, the understanding is we have to be connected to the apostles' teaching. We can't do our own thing. We need to see what the apostles' teaching is. To show you how important this word is to Paul, he uses it very rarely. I want to show you, it's about five times in all his letters. Let me show you where he uses it twice in one letter. You can get an idea of how the word for him is sort of a non-negotiable. It means more than just sort of a nice appreciation for the teaching of the church. It means what's happening. The first time is in, they're both in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 11 is the first one. Look at the first two verses. Paul says... Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So we have, just like in Philippians, he's talking about imitation and modeling. And then he says, I praise you, verse 2, because you remember me in everything and hold fast to the traditions, the paradosis, actually paradosine, but the paradosis that you have, that I handed on, paradosis again, to you. So he's saying, you're living according to the manner that I taught you. Good. Now he's going to give us two examples. The first one is, drop down to verse 23. For I received, paradosis, from the Lord, what I also handed on, paradosis, to you. And what did he receive and hand on? That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread the words of institution, the mass, we'd say today. And remember, every letter of Paul had already been written before Mark even put pen to parchment or quill to parchment. Paul's letters are all earlier than the first gospel was ever written. So this is the first written evidence we have of the Lord's Supper. And notice, Paul kind of comes back to what he's doing here as well. He says, I handed it on to you. You got it from me. Who did Paul get it from, he says? I hand it on to you. I receive from who? The Lord. 
right? Paul's not handing on his own opinion or teaching. This is what he received from Christ himself. In other words, that's where the buck stops. The only reason we know what Jesus said is because of what the apostles said, because Jesus wrote nothing. Nothing. So the way to know Jesus is to know the apostles. And that's what Paul's reminding them, you know, because they're facing a few issues that are happening. Now, the other place he mentions it is in chapter 15. And here he starts with kind of a similar um, type of, of statements. Right with verse 1. He says, For I, Now I'm reminding you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you indeed received, indeed received, paradosis, and in which you also stand. Through it you are also being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you. Then look, verse 3. For I handed on to you, so paradosis, as of first importance, what I also received, paradosis. Now he's talking about who saw the resurrected Jesus. So it, at Paul's time, it's the living proof, the living testimonial of those who are the only ones to have seen the Lord. Touched him, ate with him, etc. And he goes on to list over 500 people. So... Notice, the two times he uses this word elsewhere has to do with things about the Lord's Supper, the resurrection. In other words, we need to re recognize because um, that our Catholic tradition is not just some nice addendum or kind of thing we can take or leave. The Catholic tradition is the word of God. And from that tradition, some was written down. Some. And that's why the church from the beginning has been very careful in preserving both how the scriptures were written and preserved and copied and such over time, but also in preserving the unwritten tradition, most of which occurs, most of which had to do actually with how we interpret scripture in um, in the moral teaching of the church, in how the liturgy is lived out, and it, nowadays most of it's written down. But the idea that you know tradition is the whole thing that Jesus passed on to his apostles. Remember, at the time Paul is, is telling people this in Philippi, there are no gospels to read. They don't exist. The Philippians don't even have the other letters Paul wrote. They're not reading the letter to the Romans. It wasn't written to them, right? The church won't start to gather those together and keep them and everything for another 50, 70 years. And it'll take a long time of still deciding what is, what, what do we keep, what do we not, what is authentic, what is not. So during this whole time, you know, how are they living? They're living according to the teaching, the tradition of the apostles, this living witness, which is what we have. And... You know, it, it's important to realize what, a, as a Catholic, to really think about it sometimes about what a great gift that is. Because sometimes we buy into the Protestant thing that it's sort of like a, a slavery, right? We have all these additional things and stuff like this. I think of it this way, if nothing else. Catholicism doesn't have to reinvent the wheel every few years. It knows. Right? Protestants, another church breaks away. They have to decide anew. Well, do we baptize infants or not? What does this mean? What is that? They're always constantly sort of deciding again what things mean. In Catholicism, you've got the standard. You know, you can look and be certain. Even if you have the worst clergy in the world, you still have the tools of knowing with the church's tradition of how God wants you to live. So there's never an excuse. There's never, we always can be certain of that. That I know that I, I can find the answer of what God wants for my life. And it's going to be the same answer for the most part as most people. So it ties into what Paul is saying is, know the tradition, right? Follow the teaching. That's what you build your conscience on. Conscience is not as it's kind of popularly, popularly understood. And this is where a problem where a word is so different than it meant in the ancient times. Paul actually has a word in Greek, which it's not important, we know it, but he's the one who kind of creates this word. 
In Latin, it becomes conscience. Word science. It's important we realize this because conscience is not how I feel. Who cares? Right? There's a lot of things I don't feel like doing, and there's a lot of bad things I do feel like doing. My feelings do not determine if I'm okay with God in that. That's not my conscience. Conscience is when I know what the church teaches or what God says in Scripture, and then I look at that according to the circumstances I find myself, and I ask myself, wanting to do God's will and truly desiring to follow his will, I ask myself, is what I am doing in accord with that or against it? And I'm honest about that. And I may come up with the wrong idea. But if I was honest, in that sense, the church says, that's okay. Right? God will, over time, correct you. You'll, you'll, over time, living it out, you'll be like, yeah, I made a bad decision there. And you're not held guilty or a sinner for that. The person who just says, yeah, I thought about it with conscience. I'm, you know, I don't believe in this one for myself. Well, that's just a crock. That's just their feeling. They're just justifying what they already want. That's not conscience, and God doesn't accept that. They are guilty. In fact, more so because they're justifying it. So conscience, if we don't abuse it, is very important because as much as the church does give us guidance, the church cannot look at it. There's no way the church could know every circumstance, every possible permutation. It couldn't possibly do that. The church has to give us teachings. But I have to take the teaching and then I have to apply it to my personal life. And then there are some things that the church has no teaching on and Christians will disagree both in conscience in struggling to understand things. You know, um, what we know about secondhand smoke and such like that. So what is, the church doesn't have a teaching on that, but what does that mean now? When we know the effects of it and we're in closed areas and stuff. Should a person do it or not? I'm not going to tell you because the church doesn't have an answer. I'm saying those are where people starting to get into conscience issues. Or plastic surgery. You know, I think everyone can agree if it's restorative, there's no problem with that. You're simply repairing what was lost. But then you look at the cosmetic stuff, and then sometimes you understand it. Maybe there's a real need. Sometimes not. You know, and so you, and I'm not saying that Christians make a bulk judgment, because that's not the point. The point is you as a Christian, when you're faced with these kind of situations, are you coming to it honestly looking at the word of God and the church teaching as best you can to see the teaching and then discover and find where I fit into this. What do I want to do? Or it can be a much more, you know, you can make a real in your face type of one. If I kill this person, is it murder or not? And sometimes it has to be a split decision, which you don't have a lot of time for. Right? Is this legitimately self-defense or am I going further and I need to? Right? So, it's those kind of things. That's what conscience for. Conscience is not there to be used as your own personal sort of Bible. And that's how a lot of people, Catholics and Protestants, use it. What they do is, you know, that's why I've always made the joke about Protestants. They reject the Pope, but they make themselves Pope. That's what they've done. They just said, oh, you can't have somebody telling you what to do. And then they decide for themselves what God wants. Right? without any sort of background other than my own feeling. So real conscience is always under the teaching. It's not over it. And if there's ever a discrepancy, guess which one's wrong? Not the church. The church is guaranteed infallibility. We're not. We're not. I'm talking about church teaching. I'm not talking about theological opinions. I'm not talking those kind of things. Those aren't the teaching of the church. People can dispute those kind of things or canon law or stuff like that. But the actual teachings of the church, this is going to be the wrong one. And that's where you see where the rubber meets the road. Are you too prideful to really accept that? And you're like, nope, church is wrong. And that's a big statement. 2,000 years, 4,000 we had Israel. 4,000 years, but they're wrong? And I got it right all, all after all this time? And that was really Luther's issue. Luther disagreed with one thing, 
he quickly moved on from something that he had every right to disagree with. That is indulgences. Indulgences are not a teaching of the church in that sense, in the doctrinal sense. But what did he do very quickly? I mean, we always talk about the indulgences, but that's not what he thought about. It, it immediately became what? Faith alone. And then Luther got problematic because then the church would present him with things before he was excommunicated. Cardinal Cahayton disputed, debated Luther in front of the Pope. And he kept pointing out things. Well, this is how Augustine and this is how the church is interpreted. Here we see it in Augustine. You know, he gave him basically his, his um, points and his background, where all the evidence came from. And what was Luther's response? They're wrong. But they were all wrong. Now, the fathers are wrong sometimes on issues here and there. But to just glibly sort of say they were all wrong, but all of a sudden I know better. And then he goes beyond that, that then he's going to decide which books of the Bible we got wrong too. But based on what authority? God? Even Luther was never that bold. He never said, God told me these seven books don't belong anymore. He never said that. By his own opinion, he took them out. What a lot of Protestants don't know, embarrassingly, is he took out three New Testament books, too. And as soon as he died, Philip Melanchthon put them back in because it was embarrassing. But if you go to the Vatican Library to this day, the first edition, which we have a copy of, of that first printing of Luther's Testament in German, has no book of James. Why? Because it says you can't have, yeah, right. Faith without works is dead. Well, that can't be true then, according to what I believe. He got rid of... Um, one of the letters of John, and what was the last? Maybe two of the letters of John. So, um, you know, that's what, what we run into when we start letting our conscience be in control. Because the person there doesn't really mean their conscience. They really mean their feelings and opinions of what they want to be true. And that is not conscience. Conscience is with knowledge. So I approach truly discerning, trying to find out the truth, I have to figure out what the church teaches, if it has a teaching. If it doesn't have a direct teaching, I try to figure out as best I can um, by myself and also with help if I need to, if I have the time to you know, bring that in, of what the church would say about something or what Jesus says. And then I honestly look at the thing or action I want to perform, and, and I have to ask myself honestly, does it, does it go with what the church teaches or does it break that teaching of Christ? Because what we've done, and I know I'm going over laxing, laxing poetic, but <laughs> what we've often done, and this is why in RCIA I try to correct this, is even many Catholics have made a, sort of a break between Christ and the church. As if the church wasn't the body of Christ, that when the church teaches, the church isn't teaching its opinion or something it came up with over time. The church is just teaching and expanding in the sense of by the gift of the Spirit, what he said and did. It's not, you know, because then people, that's where you get things like, well, you know, I, I'm all about Christ. I love Christ, but not, in, you know, the church and its teachings and stuff. Really? Isn't he the one who said, he who hears you hears me? All that kind of stuff. Isn't he the one who called it his body? You cannot have the head without the body. Or else you have a dead person. St. Thomas Aquinas. Anyone who seeks to know Christ without the church has a decapitated corpse. In other words, it can't give you any life because you're breaking the very, you're saying you obey the very person personally who is the one who gave us the church. He founded the church. And so that's what Paul is telling us, that we need to stay true, Philippians and us, we need to stay true to that apostolic teaching. If you're grounded in that, if you live according to that, if you form your conscience with that in mind, if you live out that kindness and in prayer, and of course sacraments, but he's not worried about that at this moment, then as Paul says, then the God of peace will be with you. Right? Even when things are difficult, you can know your decision was correct, even if it's hard, emotionally, whatever. You can know you were doing the right thing, and that gives you peace, even in difficulty. Let's take our break. Thank you.